Thanks for joining me here again at But Now Ministry. And today we're going to start a new series of study called Who is God Healing Today? Is He healing your Aunt Sally but not your Uncle John? Is He healing your Uncle Joe but not your Aunt Virginia? Is He healing your grandma but not your neighbor's grandma? Is He healing your grandpa but your boss's grandpa at work, he's not. Who is God healing today is, is the question because if you go to Benny Hinn's ministry, he's healing people every, every day. Is he? Is he really healing people? You can look up, you can go online and look up healing and you'll, you're going to see all kinds of healing ministries. You're going to see all kinds of tongue-talking ministries. You're going to see all kinds of prophetic mi ministries. And people that will give you the prophetic word, right? And people that will tell you that God is healing today. But is He? And have you ever asked yourself this? If God is healing today, what is the purpose? Is it so that you can live 10 more years and save more up, save more money in your 401k? Is it so that you can live 10 more years and help your kids through college? Is it so that you could just live 10, year, 10 more years so you can retire and go sailing on your yacht around the world? Is that why God would heal you today? That sounds like pretty much your selfish agenda to me. That pretty much sounds like God's your gopher. That's what it sounds like to me. But let's take a look at if you have a copy of the Dictionary of Pentecostal and Charismatic Movements by Zondervan, you'll find... On page 517, Kenyon, Essek William Kenyon, 1867 to 1948, evangelist, pastor, educator, and author. Born in upstate New York, Kenyon preached his first sermon at a Methodist church in Amsterdam, New York, at age 19. After attending various schools and pastoring several churches in New England, he founded Dudley Bible Institute in Dudley, Massachusetts, a faith venture that he financed with proceeds from his evangelistic meetings in Canada, Chicago, and many parts of the Northeast, where there were thousands of reported conversions, and you ready? And healings. Thousands of reported conversions and healings. The school soon moved to Spencer, Massachusetts, and was renamed Bethel Bible Institute, where he continued as president for 25 years. The school later moved to Providence, Rhode Island, and became Providence Bible Institute. In 1923, Kenyon founded Figora Independent Baptist Church in downtown Los Angeles, where he became a pioneer in radio evangelism with broadcasts from KNX every morning. After doing a few broadcasts from Tacoma, Washington in 1931, he began a daily program from KJR in Seattle, Kenyon's Church of the Air, which led to the founding of a church there of the same name, later known as New Covenant Baptist Church. Kenyon later devoted himself more fully to in tenor itinerant ministry and writing. His 16 books have enjoyed an extensive circulation and influence. Although he was not a Pentecostal, his work, The Wonderful Name of Jesus from 1927, was widely read among oneness Pentecostals. His writings have had a broad acceptance in the deeper life and charismatic movements Various aspects of this theology later became an important influence on such diverse people as W.J. Earn Baxter, F.F. F. Bosworth, David Nunn, T.L. Osborne, Jimmy Swaggart, and many others. 
Kenyon's writings also became seminal for the ministries of, you ready? Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Don Gossett, Charles Capps, and others in the word of faith and positive confession movements. Although Kenyon had been criticized for holding to a form of Gnosticism, the similarities between Kenyon's theology and the Gnostic system are only superficial. Although Kenyon held that Jesus died both spiritual and physically, the ancient Christian Gnostics held that Jesus did not die physically, some maintaining that Jesus himself was in need of redemption. For Gnostics, redemption involved deliverance from the world and from the physical body, all matter being inherently evil. On the other hand, Kenyon believed in the physical resurrection of Christ, the redemption of the physical bodies of believers, the centrality of the incarnation, the necessity of the virgin birth, and the importance of the pre-existence of Christ, all of which were antithetical to the central tenets of Gnosticism. So, there you have, basically, you can almost say the founding father of Pentecostalism charismaticism in this country and it's amazing to believe that this person E. W. Kenyon who was reported to have thousands of conversions and healings gave Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Jimmy Swagger and Oneness Pentecostals and the charismatic movements a jump start. Let's take a look at someone else. Finus Jennings Dake on page 235 in the Dictionary of Pentecostal and Charismatic Movements. Finus Jennings Dake, 1902 to 1987, author of and this is a must-have in your library, okay? The famous Dake's Annotated Bible, teacher and pastor. The 24-year-old Dake resided with his wife in Amarillo, Texas, at the time of his ordination to the New Mexico Testis, Texas District of, you ready? The Assemblies of God in 1927 following two years of pastoral ministry there. In the mid-1920s, Dake attended Central Bible Institute. He pastored in the Dallas area for approximately nine months before becoming an evangelist. During his stint as an evangelist, he lived in Tulsa and Enid, Oklahoma. Dake accept, accepted the pastorate of the Christian Assembly in Zion, Illinois, in October 1932. Shortly after arriving in Zion, Dake spoke with his church board about purchasing the home and carriage house of John Alexander Dowie for the purpose of establishing Shiloh Bible Institute, which would later be renamed Great Lakes Bible Institute and would eventually merge with Central Bible Institute. Dake's stay in Zion was not without controversy. On February 9, 1937, Dake received a six-month jail sentence in the Milwaukee County Jail after pleading guilty to a charge of violating the Federal Man Act by transporting 16-year-old Emma Barcelli from Kenosha, Wisconsin to East St. Louis, Illinois, with hotel stops in Waukegan, Bloomington, and East St. Louis under the name of Mr. and Mrs. C. Anderson. Although pleading guilty, Dake insisted that he did not harm the girl. Despite the fervent loyalty of his wife and parishioners at Christian Assembly, as a consequence of this unfortunate mistake, as Dake's lawyer called it, Dake's relationship with the AG ended in 1937. He later joined the Church of God and finally became an independent. He, renamed, he remained Pentecostal nonetheless and did not allow this unfortunate event to ruin his life. Dake was the author of numerous books, tracts, and pamphlets. Dake is best known, however, for the notes in the strongly dispensationally orientated Dake's Annotated Reference Bible.
Bible, published by the family-operated Dake Bible Sales, incorporated of Lawrenceville, Georgia, in 1961. The New Testament was published together with Psalms, Proverbs, and Daniel. Based strictly on the King James Version, the Old and New Testaments were published jointly in 1963. This Bible contained a complete concordance and cyclopedia index, as well as maps of the Holy Land, charts of the ages and dispensations, and Dake's prized marginal notes. That of a Pentecostal. Dake's annotated Bible has Pentecostal notes. Okay. Until the appearance of Dake's decidedly Pentecostal brand of dispensationalism, there it is, Schofield's reference Bible held sway. But the Pentecostal ingredients of Dakes soon made it a favorite amongst Pentecostals. His impact upon conservative Pentecostalism cannot be overstated. His notes became the bread and butter of many prominent preachers and the staple of Pentecostal congregations. Thus, Jimmy Swagger, in a tribute to Dake, could say, I owe my Bible education to this man. Indeed, a recent article in Charisma on Dake's annotated reference Bible was titled, The Pentecostal Study Bible. Finus J. J. Dake died in 1987. Dake Bible Sales Incorporated continues under the leadership of his son, Finus Jennings Dake Jr. since 1961. 372,000 volumes have rolled, all the, rolled off the presses of Dake Bible Sales each year, 28 to 30,000 copies of Dake's in its various forms. Paperback, leather bound are sold according to Finus Jennings Dake Jr. So, if you want to get your copy, and it's a must-have for your library, of the finest Jennings Dake Study Bible, it is your reference to Pentecostal, to the Pentecostal movement. He is, and they didn't say it in this dictionary, but I would say that he is the godfather of Pentecostalism in this country. His study Bible has encouraged many Pentecostals to teach and preach these things of healing. Let's take a look at one more in this dictionary of Pentecostal and charismatic movements. The charismatic movement, and this is on page 130, the term charismatic movement is here understood in its most common usage to designate what Donald G. in the late 1950s called the New Pentecost, namely the occurrence of distinctly Pentecostal blessings and phenomena, baptism in the Holy Spirit, with the spiritual gifts of 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, outside a denominational and or confessional Pentecostal framework. Although the designation sometimes refers specifically to this work of the Spirit within the historic church traditions. It is here used in a wider sense to include non-denominational patterns of charismatic Christianity. This is to say, charismatic movement here refers to all manifestation of, of Pentecostal-type Christianity that in some way differ classical Pentecostalism in affiliation and or doctrine. And it just goes to say when it started. So the subject here is treated as follows. In development in North America, earliest stirrings was pre-1960. So, like I told you about Dake, that was 1961. And then you had Kenyon, who was, let me go back here, that was actually his starting was 1923 to 1931. And he published the book, The Wonderful Name of Jesus, in 1927, which was read among oneness Pentecostals. The emergence of the movement began in 1960 to 1967. The movement takes shape from 67 to 77. It began in consolidation in 1977 to 87. Okay, that's in North America. And then it tells us its development in Europe. And the essential elements in the charismatic renewal are a focus on Jesus, praise, love of the Bible, God speaks today, evangelism, awareness of evil, spiritual gifts, 
eschatological expectation, spiritual power, and that is, those are the things and or doctrines that they pretty much hang themselves with, okay? And so as we go through this study and we see if the Pentecostal charismatic movement is right, and we take a look and see who is God healing today, we are going to find out if the Pentecostal charismatic movement is right. And here's one thing I want you to chew on, okay? The word Pentecost. The word Pentecost means Jewish feast day, okay? We here, including myself, which is mid-Acts, dispensational, Pauline, right divider of my 1769 King James Bible, not the Dag Dake Annotated Bible, although I do use that to reference things when I am preaching and teaching, but being that I'm mid-Acts, being that I'm Pauline, I believe the church, the body of Christ, starts with the Apostle Paul. So what does that say about Pentecost? What does that say about Pentecost? That says that I don't believe the church, the body of Christ, starts at Pentecost. Okay, I believe it starts when Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9. So my response to the Pentecosts and Charismatics is they are in a time in their Bible at Pentecost when what's actually happening, if you read it, is the fall of Israel, is when the world is going to end. It's that last year of the world, and that's according to the parable of the fig tree that you find in Luke, okay? Now, if that's what I believe, and by the way, the church at Pentecost is not called the Pentecostal church. That was the Jerusalem church that was doing things on the Jewish feast day, which is Pentecost. So that Jerusalem church, which Saul of Tarsus was persecuting, and you'll find that in Acts chapter 8, was actually the church that began in Matthew 15 with Peter. So it's not anything new is my point. And in Acts 2, many were added to that church, which is not the church of, or the church which is called Pentecost. It's actually the church at Jerusalem that happened on the Jewish feast day, which is Pentecost. Do you follow me? So the Jerusalem church is basically celebrating the Jewish feast day of Pentecost. But yet people say that that's an actual church that started at Pentecost. No, that is not what the Bible says. So if you can get those two things right, and then maybe you can get that third thing right that I said, that it's actually prophecy that has come true, and that would be the parable of the fig tree. Okay? Where the Lord Jesus Christ gives Israel one more year to repent. And that one more year to repent for Israel is Acts chapters 1 through 8. Okay? So with all that being said, that I believe the church, the body of Christ, starts with the Apostle Paul. And that the church that celebrates Pentecost is actually the church of Jerusalem that started in Matthew 15. So, in Exodus 19.5 and Exodus 19.6, God said to Moses, now therefore, ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Exodus 19.6 And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the Baptists, unto the Methodists, unto the Presbyterians, unto the Jehovah Witnesses. No, unto the children of Israel. So we can clearly see what God said to Moses to give to, to speak to the children of Israel. Okay, that means we're not here. I'm not a child of Israel. Are you? 
So Moses is clearly talking to the children of Israel, not us. And he's talking about a kingdom of priests and an holy nation, okay? The end of Exodus is very clear that God was instructing Israel, not us. Without a doubt. That's exactly what the verse says, correct? So Peter said in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, for Israel, okay? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We know who Peter was ministering to when he said, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, not us. Do you, do you know that? Do you know who Peter is a minister to? Well, let's take a look and see who he is. Matthew chapter, let's see who his ministry is to. Because a lot of people, like the Roman Catholics, say he's the first pope, right? Well, if he's the first pope, then that means, if you're a Roman Catholic, he's your minister, right? So if he's your minister, and he's the first pope, then my Bible's wrong. Because let's take a look and see what the Bible says. And by the way, this is the 1769 King James Bible, God's perfect words without error. Okay? It's not West Cotton Hort's dumbed-down New American standard that will lead your soul to hell. Okay? Or better yet, damn your soul to hell. No, it's the King James Bible, that of the 1769. Every single word is God's perfect words without err. Okay? So Matthew 10 so we go back to the Old Testament. This is before Christ dies on the cross in Matthew chapter, or I'm sorry, yeah, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go to all your denominations and tell them to follow you. Oh, nope, that's not what he said. He said this, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. Oh, so that would get rid of all your denominations, your cults, your religions, right? Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So clearly, on the authority of God's perfect words, the 1769 King James Bible, not your dumbed-down English substandard version of that of West Cotton Hort, Dewey Reams, of that of the Vaticanus, of that of the Latin Vulgate, okay? But that of the majority text, God's perfect words, the King James Bible, that of the 1769, where 47 men, the learned men, put this translation together. It is perfect without error. It is God's Bible, okay? Peter only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So here it is again. So you have Moses in Exodus speaking unto the children of Israel. You have Peter in the Old Testament of Matthew where Jesus is in his earthly form, God manifest in the flesh, before he dies on the cross, is Old Testament doctrine for Israel on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. He's only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, what Moses said and what Peter said is not to us today. And by the way, they're both in the Old Testament. Moses back in Exodus is Old Testament, and Peter back in Matthew before Jesus Christ on the, dies on the cross on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 17 is Old Testament. Now, if you notice when I spoke about the 12, Peter's name wasn't mentioned. It was Simon who was called Peter, right? But then when you go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, what does Paul say about Peter? And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, that gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So there's Cephas, 
And then there's Simon in Matthew chapter 10, right? Well, Cephas is another name for Peter, in case you didn't know. Well, how do I figure that out? Let's take a look at John chapter 1, verse 42, which, by the way, is Old Testament doctrine for Israel. We can get definition from John. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is an interpretation, a stone. Ah, so Simon, thou, the son of Jonah, is called Cephas. And in Matthew 10, the first Simon who is called Peter. So let's get more clarification. Let's go to John chapter 21, which, by the way, is New Testament doctrine for Israel because it's after the Lord Jesus Christ dies on the cross, is buried and rose again, okay, on the third day. John 21, 17. But we can go to Israel's New Testament and get definition of who Peter is. And notice, I'm going only into Israel's doctrine to figure out who Peter is. I'm not going to where Paul preaches the revelation of the mystery, which is, by the way, Paul's writings, even though you have to rightly divide Paul's writings about the body of Christ with what he says about Israel. Okay. John 21, 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Thou hast, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And then we look at, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark chapter 3, verse 16, which, again, on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, is Old Testament doctrine for Israel under the law. Mark 3, 16, we get definition according to Israel's program. And Simon, he surnamed Peter. There it is. And Simon, he surnamed Peter. And Jesus said to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not us. And this is what Jesus said. Matthew 4, verse 23, and again, Matthew chapter 4 is Old Testament doctrine for Israel. It is before the Lord Jesus Christ dies on the cross. And Jesus went about all gallery, Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Notice, Jesus did not teach in a church. He is teaching in their synagogues. Jesus healed all manner of sickness and disease. Did you notice that? Teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Well, most of these pastors today, especially the Pente Pentecostals and charismatic preachers and teachers, they're healing and they're in a church. Jesus healed and teaching in the synagogues. That's quite different, isn't it? So that's something to think about, too. How many churches did the Lord Jesus Christ go to in his earthly ministry and per perform healings? Think about that one. And as you're thinking about that one, Email me with any doctrinal questions from my website at preachingthegospelthatsaves.com. Subscribe to my YouTube channels if you have not, my bookstore blog. Check out my study on Ephesians. And as we continue the study of healing, my hope is that you figure out what God is doing today when it comes to healing. Thanks again.